had no idea. How do you act as a, as a professor at Diné College? He didn't know. How do you dress? You know, the first day he came in, he wore a tie. He had a tie on. It wasn't a cool bolo tie like I've got on. It was, it was a Western tie. So he was acting like a Westerner. And he, of course, he always wears hats. He's a hat guy. So how do you act? Well, uh, the only way to determine this is by going there and finding out what other people are wearing or what they're acting like. And this is how you, you, you find out how to be a professional. You need to go and you need to find out how the people react or act uh, uh, at your business. <coughs> Uh, I've worked at uh, I've worked at a lot of colleges. Uh, sometimes you have to wear ties, you know, and suit coats, <clears throat> dress all get all dressed up so that the students think that you know what you're talking about. <laughs> Looking <laughs> so you, like you. Know yeah, yeah. Don't look like you know what you're talking about. <clears throat> uh, but other other places I've been, everybody wore like uh, work shirts, French work shirts. Okay, so that you're one with the, with the people. Uh, okay. Um, some people wore sweatshirts, some people wore shorts. If you're in San, Di San Diego, you wear shorts and, and flip-flops. Florida, you wear shorts and flip-flops. You wear a t-shirt. Doesn't have to be a new t-shirt. Doesn't have to be a clean t-shirt. <laughs> you know, it's just a little bit more laid back. But I mean, if you go to Harvard they, and you wear shorts and flip-flops, You wouldn't be acceptable. People would, uh, wouldn't like you. So what you need to do in order to be a professional is you have to go and find out what, uh, what you're supposed to look like. And of course, Jeremiah wore his tie the first day. He hasn't worn a tie since. He figured uh, he doesn't have to do that anymore. To be a professional uh, instructor at, at Diné College or any other college, potentially you don't have to wear a tie. He's figured that out. <clears throat> So, when you are a counselor, what do you need to look like? What do you need to act like? Uh, you need to look like, uh, you need to make your, your client comfortable. So you need to wear clothes that will do not intimidate your client. Uh, some people wear suits and, or, and suit coats um, because they're trying to intimidate their clients, and that's not that's not good. It may work in New York City, but probably wouldn't, wouldn't uh, that game wouldn't play in, in Omaha, Nebraska, or Salem, Arizona, or Chin Lee, or Tuba City, or whatever. Uh, so you need to make your clients comfortable, and this is, this is the professionalism that they're talking about. You need to talk in a manner that makes them feel comfortable. Scope of practice involves knowing uh, what activities, knowledge, and skills identified by licensing board and professional organizations relate to your discipline. And of course, you need to find out what the rules are and follow the ones, and, and follow most of the rules. Does it mean you have to follow all the rules? Well, sometimes you don't. But you, of course, you need to be ethical. And of course, you're going to take a test to see just how ethical you are. I know. <laughs> Just don't think like like Trump. He's an ass clown, isn't that? Yeah, ass clown. Uh, sometimes organizations will employ groups of professionals that they will organize into working teams. Each member will bring their own professionalism, their own culture, their own education, and individual ways of dealing with clients. And this is good. This is one of the reasons. This is I really enjoyed working here with Sarah. Uh, because uh, Sarah and I, were, we kind of played off of each other. Uh, in other words, uh, she was one way and I was another way. And, what, and she had her way of thinking and I, I had my way of thinking. And what I, I thought we needed to do was show them two different pictures of what it means to be a psychologist. So I enjoyed teaching with, with Sarah because uh, Sarah was very much different than I was. She's Canadian, she went to Northwestern, she used to teach at San Diego State. Um, you know, she had different ideas, she, she had different ways of presenting the material. She was a cognitive psychologist, I'm a general psychologist, and I thought that uh, it was good for you guys to see uh, two different ways of looking at the world. Yes, sir? What's, what's a cognitive psychologist? 
A cognitive psychologist uh, is a psychologist that believes that um, psychology should be the study of thought and the structure of the brain. Now, the funny thing about cognitive psychologists is they don't study the structure of the brain. They just study your thinking processes. That's so a cognitive. Like CBT, CPT, that kind of stuff? Oh, yes, yes and no. Um, they do a lot of research. Cognitive psychologists are research psychologists. Okay. Um, yeah, they're not counseling psychologists. Some of them don't even believe in counseling as weird as that may seem. They, they're, they're almost like, all they want to do is study structure. And the way you study structure is by doing research. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I know, it's, it gets weird. Anyway, so she was that kind and I was, I was a generalist. Uh, she had only studied psychology and I would studied like everything. <laughs> History, English, political science, and medicine, I know. So I had studied everything she'd studied. Anyway, so I thought that it was a good balance. I thought it could be a good balance. But of course it antagonized her uh, from time to time. Anyway, so if we put a group together, it's not a bad idea to have people that aren't the same. You don't want everybody to be exactly the same. Because it gives you two different ways of looking at the world or two different ways of looking at things, or five different ways of looking at things. So if we put a, a working group together and they're all cognitive psychologists, they're all going to have those ideas. And you're not going to have anybody with any other ideas. But if we put a, uh, a, a working group together and we have a historian and we have a sociologist and we have a social worker and we have a psychologist and we put them all together and we try to come up with a solution to a problem, we've got a lot of different ways of looking at things. Yes, ma'am? Is there a sociology program here? Uh, we have a sociologist, Miranda Haskey, teaches sociology. But it's just psychology, right? No, she it's teaches sociology. Like sociology as a major, as a whole? No, I'm not as a major. Social work. Social work, we do have a social work associate degree. We have a social sciences uh, so degree. So to go into counseling, um, social and behavioral science and social work, are they two different things? Yes, but you can get there from, the, from by using either one of them. So if you get a, a, an associate degree in, in social sciences, then you can get into the psychology BA program. Mm -hmm. Okay. Social work. Social work is, is kind of a different um, discipline, but it's still a counseling discipline. And that's, that's window rod. Our social worker is at window rod. And then that's oh. the gate. Like to take the responsible conduct of research <coughs> selection board. Researchers, research administrators, let's be researchers. Okay, so I don't know what you're asking. Okay. Alright. <clears throat> okay. Uh, one of the best uh, counseling psychologists, one of the best counselors I, I have ever met was a social uh, person that was had a master in social work. She was a social worker. She was really good. Have something for you. Thank you. You're welcome. This isn't yours. This is <laughs> this is Irene's. This is all my students. Damn. I know. I've got 24 pages of students. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Well, I got Colty three times, so it's not so bad. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, you're taking three classes. <laughs> so even though there's 178 students, 176, 178, I don't know. Anyway, it's you three times, and it's Cheyenne 150 times. <laughs> <laughs> well, how many 
classes have you taken with me? Three? Four. Four. So it's her four times. It's you two times. It's just twice. Yeah, I've got Scott three times. There we go. I got Corey at least twice. Three. Three? Okay. <laughs> I never look at the online stuff. I never memorize people's names. <clears throat> I don't remember what I was talking about. We're talking about professionals. <laughs> Working product productively with interdisciplinary teams is an important aspect of being a professional. So you have to be able to work with a lot of different people. You have to be able to get along with a lot of different people. This may mean that the practitioner must learn the language of another profession, which is always a trick. Yeah, okay, I spelled it right, didn't I? Is profession spelled correctly? Okay. Are there two Fs? No, there's only one F. Okay. Every professional must respect the expertise of their professional colleagues, which is never easy because if you're a cognitive psychologist, you think that all other psychologists are idiots. <laughs> I know. If you're a Freudian, you think that Freud's the only, the only person with, the, with any answers. If you're a Jungian, you think that, there, that Jung had uh, the answer to all, all of life's questions. This is kind of a problem because you don't believe anybody else. But as a professional, we should believe everybody else, and we should understand that they do have expertise, and they have a different way of looking at things. And potentially, they have a different nomenclature that they use. The practitioner working in a team must recognize the different professionals may work toward the same goal using different methods, like the social worker. A uh, social worker and a counseling psychologist. A uh, social worker, uh, would never, ever, 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 ever uh, bring a, somebody into their, into their uh, office to counsel. They want to go to their house so that they can see them in their natural environment. A lot of times when people go someplace, like to the doctor, they get all dressed up. And then they put on airs because, you know, they've got makeup on today. And normally they don't wear makeup. So today they're going to act differently. So you're not going to get the right picture of what the problem is with that individual. That's how the social workers think. Psychologists never go to somebody's house, ever. It's too dangerous. They make them come into their office, then they're all dressed up and they got makeup on them. Nobody knows what, what their real problem is. And maybe they never find out what their real problem is because they need to go see them in their environment. They need to smell what it smells like in their house. I was talking to Jeremiah about this last night. Smelling things. Some people don't, can't smell things. It's like a third of the population doesn't smell sweat. So if you're in a bus with somebody that really hasn't bathed in, in months, they don't even smell it. But he may stink, or she may stink, whichever the case may be. Usually it's a guy. Guys are slobs sometimes. Okay. Even in, uh, in the same profession, practitioners may use different approaches. And of course, everybody has their own expertise. Does that mean that they're wrong because they don't do it the way you do it? The answer is no. If you're a professional, then you will accept their expertise as potentially working. Your supervisor will help evaluate your level of competency providing feedback about your uh, use of skills, uh, inviting you to engage in self-reflection, and of course, uh, after class, even, even uh, despite the fact that I have 25 years of experience doing this, talking in front of people, every time I get out of a class, I think, what the hell did I do wrong this time? Okay, so I try to improve my, my, my uh, uh, production, I try to improve my, my uh, lecturing skills. <clears throat> and sometimes I think, like last week, or uh, Monday, I had a bad lecture day on Monday. First of all, I didn't have anybody to talk to in my first class because Scott wasn't here, and <laughs> Earlson wasn't here, so I was talking to myself. But then again, then, and, then, and then this class started, right, on Monday, and I, I, I just wasn't on. I mean, there was something wrong, and I'll show you what was wrong in just a second. I know. There was actually something that was wrong, but I didn't know what it was. I could feel it, but I couldn't put my finger on it. But now I can put my finger on it, so I'll show you in a minute. We'll wait and see if Emory shows up. 
<laughs> uh, consultation involves meeting with an expert who can help you solve a particular dilemma or problem. Sometimes your client's problem may be beyond you or your team's ability to handle. At this point, you need to call in a consultant. I uh, remember I told you I worked as a consultant with a friend of mine. Uh, he, was, he was the guy that tried to determine if somebody who was a sex offender uh, should be released from prison or a, a pedophile. Now, sometimes you have to release them anyway because you can only hold them in jail for a certain amount of time. Unless you can ascertain that they are a threat to, to society. And then, even then, sometimes you still have to release them. You have to present all this material before a judge. I know, it, it gets ugly. And so we, he, was, he, he had a deadline and he had like 30 people that he had to evaluate, so he, he uh, called me in and, and we evaluated all these people. It's really kind of fascinating. He called me in as a consultant. Uh, and the reason he called me in is because I had the most realistic attitude toward uh, sexuality. We had a conversation, I know. Yeah, we had, we had a conversation. Some, I felt like you were on the like your lecture. Well, last on Monday. Yeah. Okay, I'll show you what was what the problem was in just a second. If Emory ever shows up. Most professions set uh, ethical gu guidelines for remaining current with best practices, continuing education, evaluating your work, continuing education and ethical standards every year. So one of the things you have to do is continuing education. You have to make sure that if they have changed things, and things change all the time. We're doing research constantly. Uh, and sometimes the research shows that maybe we need to change the way we do things. And of course, that has to do with best practices. Uh, so this Freud work, uh, a lot of people don't like Freud. They don't even mention Freud. Uh, but uh, if we're dealing with somebody with a, a sexual problem that started when they were three years old, potentially, when they discovered uh, the difference between boys and girls, uh, then we need to take them back to that point. And that's what Freud tells us we have to do with everybody, of course. So Freud doesn't always work, but, some, but sometimes he's the only way that you can get to the right, to the problem. We need to fix the problem. We need to fix the root cause of the problem. If we're just taking away symptoms, I mean, that's the way doctors work. They just throw pills at you so the, your symptoms go away, and then you're happy. But sometimes they haven't really taken care of the problem. They're just giving you medication that makes you feel better. Sometimes that medication makes you okay in this aspect, but it makes you sicker. Or it, it changes your biochemical structure. And now we got another problem because we just blew your liver up. Whoops. They are just constantly taking... And they, exactly. We want to fix this problem. And of course, it started five medications ago when we, we blew out your liver and now we have to give you special medication to fix your liver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, the practitioner is responsible for structuring the relationship with the client. Success can only be reached if the relationship is collaborative, goal-directed, purposeful, and time-limited. A lot of times uh, the limit is given to you by your insurance company. Insurance company says, oh, they're depressed. Uh, you have 10, you can see them 10 times. And, and if you can't fix them in, in 10 uh, sessions, then, then you can apply to, to get two um, uh, additional sessions. Okay, that's the way it works. Time limited. So you need to fix them as quickly as you possibly can. You need to help people as quickly as you possibly can. That's because the insurance companies don't want to pay forever. A relationship between a client and a practitioner is a fiduciary relationship. Fiduciary is a word that means that usually we use this in banking, but fiduciary just means that you trust somebody. So if you have a fiduciary trust, it's a trust trust organization. <laughs> We have fiduciary organs, uh, we have banks that are fiduciary. In other words, they are a trust company. And if they are a trust company, it's like a, being a, uh, wait a minute, what are they called? Savings and loan. Okay. Well, there's, there's Emory, see, he's, he's here. <laughs> uh, I was waiting until you got here. Okay, this is perfect. I'll show you what was wrong on, on Monday in just a second. 
One more. I have to do one more slide. I'm equal with a practitioner. What are we talking about? The nature of professional relationships. Uh, your relationships is unequal, and that's what you need to recognize. It is unequal. Uh, the practitioner has more power than the client does. The client has no power whatsoever. And sometimes you'll get a client that wants to compete with you for who is in charge. Okay. <laughs> and all you do is fight back and forth. Who's, who's, who's got the most power? You or me or you or me? Now, usually a, a counselor is an individual that doesn't need to, to have power. You just don't need it. So you, you let the, the, the client feel as empowered as possible because you don't want to struggle with them. There's, there's no reason to struggle with them. You've, you're fixed. Your brain works okay. You don't have to worry about it. <clears throat> and they want to fight. So go ahead and let them fight. Go ahead and let them have, be on, in charge. That's fine. Because you don't need it, but they do. And so, you know, you still can't fix them anyway. It's okay. Don't worry about it. There's nothing we can do for these people. They have to be in charge of everything. And there's something in their life that they can't be in charge of. Okay. I had a, um, a colleague uh, when I was working at Fort Belknap. And she had a problem with her husband. Um, her husband thought she was the dumbest person in the world, wouldn't let her say anything. So every time I talked to her, I never said anything because I couldn't get a word in edgewise, for one thing. But also, I mean, she needed, she needed to feel empowered because her husband wouldn't let her say anything, as weird as that may seem. She is a writer. She writes, uh, she has a column in the newspaper. And that's what she does. She writes columns. Of course, when she goes home, she can't say anything to her husband because he dominates all conversations. And if she says something, he tells her how stupid she is. Okay. But she is empowered because she writes this column and she writes to everybody in Montana. Kind of. Your Pringles edition. <laughs> we talked about that. Did you talk about it? Newcastle. <laughs> Pringles Anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> but with power comes a responsibility to help the client in a manner prescribed initially by the practitioner. And of course, this is your responsibility. You have to have, you have to, to accept that, the fact that you are in charge. Okay. But, like I said, if we have an individual that, that needs to be empowered, sometimes that's all we can do. And that's the end of chapter Okay, now I'm going to show you what the problem was on Monday. Okay, I had a really strange feeling on Monday. I had a feeling that something was wrong, and I thought it was me. <clears throat> Turned out it wasn't me at all. While I was in class, my wife was being hit by a tornado. <clears throat> I know, this is in, in Iowa, of course. Anyway, it uh, didn't hit the house. Uh, but it ripped off the uh, barn door. Here's my barn door. Here's my barn. Isn't that a gorgeous barn? Yeah. That it really is. Nice. It's an old milk barn. It's gorgeous. This is, this is the thing, the, the, the rail that uh, the barn door rolled on. This, this thing weighs about 500 pounds. Now, if you know anything about officers, they're in charge, always in charge, right? Uh, but uh, they never, and they make decisions but they never do anything physical, right? Isn't that, yeah, exactly, okay. So my wife's trying to figure out how to fix the barn. If I was there, of course, I, I'm enlisted, I've got that mentality, so I would fix the barn. I could fix the barn. Potential, oh, I can't lift this, it weighs 500 pounds. Anyway, but that's what it looks like in Iowa. See how green it is? That's why I miss green when I come to this part of the world. Don't tell me how green <coughs> the pinyon trees are. Go ahead. No, I, I wanted to ask, did you really have a feeling? I did. I had, I had a feeling that something was wrong. So, oh, into my next question. Sure. How does uh, psychology um, look at or understand like um, clairvoyance? Or intuition? Have there been intuition? They don't. They, don't, they, they don't, there, don't recognize it. Have there ever been any studies? Tons of studies. and. <clears throat> There's nothing definitive. <laughs> as sad as that is, let me show you another picture. This is a close-up of the barn. As you can see, the rail's been torn off. Dang. 
Yeah. That's, that's a new barn door, by the way. It's, it's only like seven or eight years old. They had a wooden barn uh, door that weighed like a thousand pounds, half a ton, that you had to roll you know, back and forth. It didn't roll very well, so they took it off and put in the new one. And this is a lot lighter. It's only 500 pounds instead of a thousand pounds. So is there like a psychological term like with delusion or something with, with people who claim to be clairvoyant? How does, psychology, no. how does the psychology field view people? Like people who read tarot cards or psychics? They don't recognize it as, as legitimate. Do they just consider them con artists or do they consider them? <laughs> they are con, con, con artists. No, it's, it's not right. And uh, yeah, there's the barn door. You can see it's all been up. That's where the tornado grabbed it. And flipped it off the off its rails. Anyway, that's that's what we're dealing with right now. Do you have a picture of your wife? <laughs> you, make her like, you make her sound like a monster, but she just sounds adorable. <coughs> adorable? Yes. My wife? I don't think so. Because you show us pictures of everything else. She's a full bird, right? Make sure it's a good picture. Oh, wait a <laughs> I don't think any of these are pornographic. What the colonel was. I thought we talked no, about this last class. <laughs> <laughs> don't show us something we can't unsee. <laughs> something oh, yeah. we'll need counseling for. <laughs> uh, there's my wife. She's the one on the left. Is that your grandson? That's my grandson, yeah, the one in the in the mask. That's my wife. Wait a second. That's my grandson. Aww. I know, there's something wrong with that kid. <laughs> <laughs> what else do we have here? Uh, most of these are pictures of Reese, my grandson. My wife doesn't like to have her picture taken. She thinks she's too fat. But then again, she struggled with that uh, when she was in the service. That's my dog. You want to see my dog? There's my grandson again. <laughs> I know. His eyelashes are like this long. I mean, they're like a foot long. Not fair. That's my daughter and my, my grandson. I guess that's the only picture of my wife I have. <laughs> like I said, she doesn't want to have a picture taken. And maybe that's it. No, that's my that's my son and my daughter. Uh, my daughter was <laughs> was nominated for the Golden Apple Award in Florida, and uh, she came in third, and that's my son. You know, he's a bodybuilder. He's, he's got arms the size of my legs. <laughs> <laughs> he was a, he was a um, uh, soccer coach and track coach. Sounds like Navajo Nation's EPA over there. Sorry? <laughs> She's a weightlifting coach and he, he lives right. But he never does what she tells him to do. Oh, there he is. Oh, that's cool. That's a nice picture. First day of school. I'm sorry? Has your family like come here before? My wife was here the first semester I was here. Then she, she went back. Well, the problem was, and I think I told you guys this story, um, my daughter wanted to move to Iowa. And uh, the, the father didn't want, didn't want her to. So there was a legal battle, and my wife went down there to help with, with all that. Anyway, 
the first year that I moved here, your wife was down here for Halloween because both of you were wearing costumes. One of you was a devil. Right. Was it you? <laughs> the devil? No, shh. No, we were both zombies, weren't we? I don't think so. No, maybe I was the devil. Okay, I was. I was <laughs> I'm a little devil. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. Anyway, so she's she's up she's up there now with my daughter. I guess she figures she needs to take care of it, my daughter more than she needs to take care of me. <laughs> I can take care of myself, but uh, my grandson is down there. Uh, use of self. What are we talking about? A practitioner should begin a professional relationship by determining how they will present themselves and how they will behave. Uh, it is important for the practitioner to set aside their personal feelings and concerns in order to fully focus on their client. And this is really important. Uh, you're not there for you. You're not there for the paycheck. You're there for the client. Uh, I'm not here for me. I'm not here for my, uh, for my ego. Uh, I'm not here for the paycheck. I'm here for you guys. And that's why I'm here. That's why I'm teaching eight damn classes. <laughs> And it's killing me. It's killing me already. So keep an eye on me. If, if you see me get really grouchy or if I stop laughing, then I'm starting to suffer from all the work that I'm doing. I graded last night. I graded all weekend. And I graded last night and I graded all day yesterday. People keep cleaning. I don't mind if students come in. That's fine. But uh, my colleagues coming in and BSing with me? No, that's okay. <laughs> I need a break uh, from time to time. It is important that a practitioner accepts and understands the client's beliefs, their perceptions, their stereotypes, their biases, their prejudices, and their life experiences. They've experienced, you may have been in the same place at the same time, but what they experienced may not be what you experienced. Maybe you were more resilient in this instance, and they were less resilient. And that's something that you have to accept. That's something that you need to understand. That just because you've done it and they've done it doesn't mean that they're going to have the same reaction that you are. Uh, they do have, they will have biases and prejudices. You have biases and prejudices. Potentially you don't have biases and prejudices. You've discarded all of them. You understand that everybody is, is an individual. And you can't uh, lump people together. Not all black men are dangerous just because they're black and they're male. <clears throat> they're not, so you can't shoot them in the street whether they're armed or unarmed for no reason whatsoever. Anyway, biases and prejudices. But there are some people with those biases and those strange <clears throat> prejudices. Uh, the core interpersonal qualities that a practitioner brings to a relationship includes their warmth, their respect. You have to respect everybody. It's going to be the hardest thing in the world the first time you have a child molester in your office and you have to counsel this individual. You want to just punch them right in the face. But you can't do that. You have to respect everybody. There's a reason why they do what they do. And that's what you need to get to. There is something, there's a, a, a malfunction in this individual, and you need to get to that and figure out what it is. And fix it if you possibly can. But the only way to do that is to show them respect. And if you don't show them respect, then they're not going to, they're not going to interact with you. It's the toughest thing in the whole wide world. And this is, remember I told you that uh, uh, the social workers down in, in the South, had a very difficult time dealing with African Americans because all the social workers were white and the African, then they didn't have any respect for African Americans. This is what they were taught. This is how they grew up. So they didn't have any respect for these select individuals. But you have to have respect for your client or you can't help them. And if you don't have respect for your client, you need to find somebody else to help that, that client, because you're not going to be able to work with them. <clears throat> no matter who they are, no matter what they are, even if they're from a family that you don't like, it doesn't really make any difference. You've got to respect everybody. And if you can't respect them, you're, potentially you're in the wrong game. 
This is the way it works in the emergency room, too. <clears throat> this is what I learned when I was working in medicine. If you don't respect that individual, uh, then you're going to have a really hard time treating that, that patient. That patient may die. You may kill that individual if you don't have respect for them. First of all, they need to trust you. And the only way that they can trust you is if you show them respect. If you show them that you know who they are and that you accept who they are. This was tough. I worked in a trauma center in Omaha. And you don't think, well, there's a movie on now. Uh, something about Omaha. Two people out of Omaha or something. Anyway, uh, Omaha, had, the northern portion of Omaha, is, uh, is a black ghetto. It's African American. The south side of, of uh, Omaha is uh, down near the stockyards. That's where all the, uh, the Catholic immigrants came in. And they would come in in waves, so you'd, you'd get uh, Italian immigrants, then Polish immigrants, then uh, uh, Slovakian immigrants. I mean, it was really kind of weird. So Omaha is, was settled in waves of immigrants. And of course, uh, they, they do have a relatively large black population in Omaha. So anyway, my, the trauma center was on, in the northern portion of Omaha. It was right there, on the, right on the edge of the, uh, of the black ghetto. And so most of our trauma patients, a lot of our trauma patients were black. But, I mean, you get all kinds of trauma patients. Uh, but uh, we had doctors that had a difficult time with African Americans. They didn't have respect for the African Americans. And a lot of times they lost the patients just because the patient didn't feel comfortable in the hospital. A hmm. uh, similar thing happened with Native Americans. A lot of uh, children were taken from homes. And then they had to uh, still the Indian Child Welfare Act. Right. Because a lot of kids were just being taken, and <clears throat> uh, there was no cultural sensitivity, there was no understanding. Exactly. Things that were accepted in, in tribal communities that weren't accepted right. from where the social workers were coming from. And so <clears throat> they, they just took them out of the house. Right. And sent them north. Yeah, so they didn't even relocate them with other, <coughs> in other family, native fa uh, relative families, or other people in the tribe, right? And other tribes that just right. gone. Right. And this was done all over the country, not just here. It was done all over the country. And they had the same problem up at Fort Belmont and Fort Peck and it, and flat, on the Flathead Reservation. They were sending these kids off the reservation to white families, and then some of these kids never came back. They started being white. <clears throat> I mean, their culture was white. They didn't have any, any uh, uh, native culture. Uh, so they lost them. I had a uh, student uh, who was taken into foster care uh, when she was very young. Uh, she was the oldest member of the family. There were six kids and she was, uh, she left her family's home when she was nine. And there were six kids, uh, five other children in the family. And all six of those kids were fostered out and they weren't fostered to the same family. She was lucky. She was fostered to a family that uh, allowed her to practice uh, her, her native ancestry. But uh, some of her brothers and sisters weren't. And, uh, and they never came back. They never came back to the reservation. She still interacts with those individuals. She's on the reservation. But, uh, but they never come back, back. And they don't claim that they're white because they were raised in a white family. Or they don't claim that they're native. Uh, so they've lost their ancestry, as weird as that may seem. And they're passing, I guess. They're white enough. Complexion, anyway. A tragedy. It's a tragedy. That's, that's actually why um, English is my first language. That happened to me when I was little. <clears throat> but I, I was fortunate that I came back. Oh, there you go. So you're one that has been able to come back. <laughs> but some people pass as non-native. Uh, they don't want to admit that they are native, and that's what happened up north. Um, of her five brothers and sisters, three of them uh, do not claim their native ancestry, despite the fact they have the same ancestry that she does. And of course, <clears throat> she was one of my students, and she, we needed to deal with this. Uh, she wanted to become a counselor, and actually she works as a counselor. She works in Child Protective Services. 
which is the toughest job in the world on the reservation because everybody hates you. They hate you if you don't take them out of the family or out of the house, and they hate you if you do take them out of the house. Uh, so she and she was working on her own reservation for a while. Uh, now she's in charge of child protective services on the Crow Reservation, which is a little bit easier because she's not doesn't have anything to do with any of the families. So they, people can't hate on they can hate her, but they don't hate her family because she's not on the Crow Reservation. As weird as that is. But we had to deal with this, and uh, I had her as a student for two years. Um, and she needed to get over this idea that this dichotomy, this, this split brain personality that she had, because she was raised in a white home, and here she was on the, on the reservation. Uh, she married onto the reservation, but then her husband was abusive. You know, there, was, there were just a ton of things that we needed to deal with before she could start, before she could start helping people. And we were able to get through it in two years. Uh, not that I was doing any counseling, of course, but classes like this made her think. And of course, I asked her questions, and they were probing questions, and, uh, and she answered them as, as honestly as she possibly could because she needed to deal with this before she could become a good counselor, before she could counsel herself. And we were successful. And then I, she went up to the University of Montana. Jeez. <laughs> and they tried to screw her up, I swear. And she used to have to come home on the weekends and talk to me in order for us to, uh, in order for her to be able to uh, get to where she needed to be as a good counselor. <clears throat> They were only seeing things from uh, the Western perspective. And she's a native living on the reservation. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were telling her uh, things like the traditions are wrong or the tra traditions don't count. Yeah, I know, it's stupid things. That you would think somebody in the middle of Indian country would know that they can't say. But of course, these were psychologists from Harvard and you know Northwestern. Stanford. So they thought that there was only one. They, and they, they thought they had all the answers. But the reality is they don't have all the answers. You guys have all the answers for your own reservation. And that's what she needed to, to understand. <laughs> what are we doing? Okay, trust can be developed by being understanding or empathic, uh, listening attentively, and showing respect. Uh, and of all of these, uh, showing respect is, is the most important part. You've got to respect the person you're talking to. And if you don't respect them, you're not going to be able to help them, even a little bit. <sighs> so if you hate somebody, I don't care who it is, if you hate somebody, you need to think about this. What, how in the world would I deal with this person if they were my client? And you have to get over your hate. You have to do away with that. You've got to love everybody. I know it's tough. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, because <clears throat> we're taught all of our lives that if you're a member of this church, then your church is right and everybody else is wrong. Uh, if, you're, if you're white, you're right. White is right. It rhymes, so it must be true. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're taught that uh, your tribe is the only tribe and all the other tribes are illegitimate or something. I don't know what, how you guys think about these things. Anyway. You gotta love everybody. You've got to be able to accept everybody. Okay? And it's not easy. It's hard. <clears throat> it wasn't hard for me because I was raised in a really strange environment where we were rejected people, so we we accepted everybody the same, as weird as that may seem. Anyway. Warmth, uh, my my mother was a nurse, you know, and that's the way she did things, and that's why she was such a good nurse. Warmth, uh, being kind and accepting in a non-judgmental way. Expression of warmth in one culture may be perceived differently in another culture. Uh, you know, how much touching do you do? Uh, up north, uh, in, in the northern plains, everybody hugs. They're huggers. They're just, they just hug on a continual basis. Uh, so when you say hello, you don't shake hands, you hug. Uh, but not down here. No, 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 no. Um, Personal space is very important. Uh, 
Sarah and I were really, it was really a weird relationship. Are you a hugger? Uh, not here, I'm not. <laughs> but up north, I'm not. <laughs> and I had to learn to be a hugger because that's not natural for people from Indiana. We're not, we don't hug people, we punch each other or something. But uh, Sarah and I were, is really kind of interesting. She's Canadian, and of course I'm from Indiana, and her personal space was like this room, and my personal space was, you know, so we'd have a conversation, and this is as close as we'd ever get to each other, <laughs> here in the door, because our personal space, we had these needs of personal space. But if you go to France, if you go to France, the French, if they want to talk to you, they have to touch you when they touch well, I know. Did you see that? They have to touch you when they touch your arm, but I'm getting close to my face. They touch, they touch cheeks. They, they're cheek touchers. They're not people kissing are, each other. People are weird. They kiss each other's cheeks. Like, it was in Farmington. This lady, oh, they do like that? She, um, she's Mexican, and she really grabbed my sister, and she hugged her, and she was, like, doing the kissing thing. And I was like, oh, my what God. The hell? <laughs> he was in Italy, too. Yeah, it was just like... <laughs> Almost my, all of Europe. Not the Germans. Not the Germans. Did I? Okay. Huh? Yeah, okay. My trade does that. Really? I mean, I understand that, but, like, complete stranger. Just like... No, I'm not... Only up north in my hugger. <laughs> if I go home, uh, and this drove drove my family crazy <clears throat> because uh, I, I went home over the summer and I saw my brother. I talk, saw two of my brothers and my sister, and and I hugged my brothers. And my brothers, <laughs> <laughs> they weren't used to that kind of thing. Hoosiers <laughs> don't hug. They ain't huggers. They're punchers. I was hugging my sister. I'm kind of lifting my arm. And I was like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, my other class is um, kind of a, like, a qualitative uh, research methods class. Mm. The, the one we're in. And my, one of the studies that I have going with my project is about um, observing readings. And it's really interesting because <clears throat> I just thought everybody would, you know, according to tradition, shake hands and, and be real cordial. But right. It's really weird. There's like a, a, a sliding chart of when you will shake hands and when you will just exactly. stay away. And it's really so that was you like their personal space. And that was surprising because I didn't really observe that before. It's only certain instances where you're required to do it. It kind of what's kind of coming out to me. But then other than that, it's hey, keep your distance. <laughs> and you never know. You never know. Marius and I are really good friends, and you know, he he helps me, and I help him from time to time. But uh, uh, when I left uh, last year, he thought I was not, not coming back. So uh, when, I, when I left, he, he gave me a hug. So, and I wasn't, I wasn't ready for it either. <laughs> Get away from me. Uh, but, you know, sometimes we shake hands and sometimes we don't, and usually we don't do anything. I mean, that's what friends do. I mean, you, you don't expect any any physical, but sometimes I pat him on the back. I mean, you, you think I'm, I'm punching him with a with a needle. It, it gets all strange and exciting, as weird as that is. <laughs> <laughs> Poor old Marius, I think on him all the time. Anyway, so we're good friends, but uh, sometimes we, we touch, we touch, we shake hands or we or pat each other on the back or whatever. And he, he hugged me the other day. Or oh, the heads on. It was weird. Yeah, the, the heads on. Yeah, she can. Dude. Give him a lip move. <laughs> uh, cheek touching is commonly used to, to show warmth. In some cultures, the, the French, the Italians, and whatnot. Uh, but Polynesians and, touch and some, some natives. Polynesians touch foreheads? They touch foreheads, right. right. Yeah, it's weird as it is. You know, in our, I, Iraq, it was not uncommon to see men holding hands. Too. Sure. I remember that. I thought, I thought it was not odd, it just it was different. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. The men, they, they hold hands. Yeah, which doesn't happen in the United States. In Vietnam, they used to put their arms around each other when they walked down. And you're thinking, geez, this is a whole country of gay people. Weird. <laughs> but they weren't gay. They were just, that was the way they did it in Vietnam. 
Yeah, it's not like even down in um, so the southern part of the uh, Arab Peninsula, they would kiss each other. Two men would kiss yeah. each other on the cheeks. Right. Um, so they got mad at each other. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't pick up that culture, that uh, that custom. I I, I take it. <laughs> okay. I it was interesting. <laughs> it is fascinating. Well, there you go. Two two buddies. But of course they're young, so they can do this. Yeah, okay. understandable. Empathy is the uh, ability to understand another person's emotions, their feelings, their thoughts, and their behavior from that po person's point of view. It's from their point of view, not your point of view. As we attune to another person's internal state, a feeling of being connected develops, and this is known as empathy. It's you, you understanding how they feel. Being empathic involves having the willingness and flexibility to put yourself in the other person's reality. And everybody has their own reality. And this is not the easiest thing in the world, recognizing another person's reality. I've been trying to do this with, with our president, but it's not easy. Because his reality ain't our reality. He's lived a very wealthy life. So his Mindset is completely different from ours, <clears throat> and we have to recognize that. If you've ever been around rich people, they have a different way of looking at things. Their idea is that everybody's after their money, <clears throat> and they want to keep as much as they possibly can. I, I went to college with, these, with, with wealthy people, and it's not easy. It's not easy for them. They think everybody is out to get them, so you can't be friends with them. They don't trust you because they have so much money they think that you want it, whether you want it or not. I guess everybody wants money. Isn't that what they want? No? Oh, yes, sir. I, I had one of my soldiers in the Army. He was, a, he was from a really wealthy family, and his whole thought process was different. I, he ended up going AWOL like, uh, a year after because it, it didn't make sense to him being in the military. But I, one time I sat there and watched him reason out going skiing. <clears throat> he was gonna go AWOL over the weekend to go down to go skiing with his friends, and he was khaki. He's like, because he started asking the questions. If I don't come back on Monday, what's gonna? How far do you think I'll get busted down? And how much money will they take? Right. And so he was weighing it not on whether I should go or not, right. or what's right or wrong, but exactly. how much it's gonna cost him exactly. all together. And I was like, that's a weird way to reason things, but... <laughs> he, 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 did he go? Yeah, he went. <laughs> did, you, did you catch him? I, I already told him, I just said, if you go, if you don't show up on Monday, you know, my hands are tied. Yeah. I, I just said, show up on Monday, I don't want to be in the first arts office because of you, but he was one of the weirdest <clears throat> persons to... Uh, I had to really try to put myself in his, his shoes to see right. how he saw things. Right. And it was always his time too. Uh, how much time you're taking away from him? His personal time. Right. His personal time. He saw it as a, a resource too. Right. So he just he saw things differently than everybody right. else, and was always weird. I had to re when I would have to explain things. I would have to re-explain it to him specifically, almost like uh, like he was slow. Learning slow. Yeah, right. he's learning. Not 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 to say slow, but like dumb. But, that if you, you know how when someone has a different learning style, right. you have to adjust it for them. Right. And it was just really odd. It was really, really challenging for me to have to do that because I would get so frustrated with them. I'm like, can you just listen to like they're <laughs> 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 Not even been alive, but that's how my goodness stays. <clears throat> so my family owns a business. So my aunt gets a lot more money than we do. So my little, my cousin sisters act like they're better than us. Because so, they have money. Yeah. So like when we would do something or like when we get lectured, they don't listen. And then when I try to explain it, and they're older than I am. And so they don't I, hear yeah, you. Yeah. And it just gets me all mad. Like, just leave. <laughs> just leave. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the way they are. Unfortunately, that's the way wealthy people are. And this is one of the reasons why, well, some, something happened yesterday. Uh, he fired John Bolton. But... He can't listen. He can't hear hear any uh, anything anybody else says because they don't speak in the same direction, the same mindset that he has. Because what he thinks is has to do with money. It always has to do with money. Always has to do with prestige or money. One of the two. So 
he has no advisors. Nobody can talk to him. And the only way to survive in his world, in his reality, is to, is to live in his reality, is to accept his reality. Of course, as a counselor, that's what we do anyway. But as President of the United States, reality still has to be reality. Poor people are still poor people. They're not chits that, that you sell or whatever. It, you know, it's easy to, to look at <clears throat> with rich people, but sometimes there's people too, they have a victim mentality, mm -hmm. and every, they have a chip on their shoulder. Everything is, even if what, yeah, if, every, if they take everything really personal, like it was a personal attack specifically at them. They're always trying to make the shoe fit. <laughs> yeah, I know that everybody hates them. Isn't that sad? Because they have so much money. Why? Because everybody thinks about them. That because they have so much money. Ah, it's so frustrating. Yeah, that's that's why Trump attacks people on on Twitter all the time. Isn't that what it is, Twitter? Okay. All right. <laughs> because he can't accept the fact that people don't like him or that, or that people have said something negative to him. That's not, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Everybody's supposed to accept everything that he says. It, it gets really weird. And of course, the news media is having just a horrible try, time trying to keep up with it. <clears throat> because they don't understand what's going on. Even the rich people. Um, Anderson Cooper grew up rich. His mother was an heiress. He had all the money in the world, but he still has a hard time understanding Trump. Or maybe he doesn't. It's everybody else that has a hard time understanding. You know, it happens to veterans too when they come back because they're living in a whole different culture and value system oh. and accountability. And then you come back, there's, you can see that real struggle for reintegration. Right. That happened to me. Or you see this uh, when somebody goes overseas and then they come back to the States and they're stationed in. in uh, in the United States, all of a sudden, your job is only eight hours a day, whereas overseas it was 24-7, and now all of a sudden it's just eight hours a day, or six hours a day, depending on how much time you can, you can steal from people. <clears throat> <four, just> <laughs> ah, yeah, so it gets a little weird. Empathy is understanding assumptions, beliefs, and, and, uh, and or their worldview. Uh, empathy requires understanding another person's subjective experience while maintaining the capacity to differentiate from that person. Empathy is not the same as pity or sympathy. Pity involves sorrow or grief aroused by someone else's suffering. This is not that. You have empathy. You understand what they're thinking. Uh, sympathy involves feeling uh, affected by whatever affected the other person. And of course that's sympathy and pity. Uh, but empathy is totally different. I understand where you're coming from. That's what empathy is. Understanding where they're coming from. Uh, Bill Clinton was elected president because he said that. I understand where you're coming from. He said it once in a debate. And, and everybody understood that he really did understand what they were, where they were coming from. And they elected him twice. Second time they elected him was after he, they tried to impeach him. And he still was elected president of the United States because he understood people. And he said that. And when he looked at people, they, under, they knew that he was <clears throat> trying to understand where they came from. Um, he was referred to as the first black president because black people voted for him. And they felt like he really did understand what, where they were coming from. Uh, but he also, helped, he also understood native natives to the extent that he held the reservations. Uh, he sent a lot of money to the uh, reservations. So, sure. There you go. That's Bill Clinton. Uh, <laughs> respect. Respect or unconditional positive regard is expressed by affirming and appreciating clients without condoning their harmful behaviors. You're not saying uh, it's okay that you are a child molester. What you're saying is I understand who you are and I respect you for who you are but not your bad behavior. Looking, you look for the good in, in select individuals. Re, you regard, you have regard for their thoughts, their feelings, and their abilities. Uh, noticing, acknowledging, and highlighting clients' strengths, capabilities, resilience, coping abilities, potential, and resources. What you're trying to do is you're trying to find their strengths, and you're trying to focus on their strengths. 
And if you can do this, it will show that you have respect for who they are and what they've been through. And that's what you need to do. One of the ways to do this is to look people in the eye. Not in the <clears throat> Sure you do. When I'm counseling somebody, I have to look them in the eye. When I'm talking to somebody, I look them in the eye. Whether I'm on the reservation or not. I'm not talking about little kids. I'm talking about, <laughs> of course, I'm 100 years old too. So that, that may make a difference as well. But if you can look somebody in the eye, a lot of times if I don't want to pay attention to somebody, I don't look you directly in the eye. I, I look at something else. I start talking to you, but I don't look you in the eye. But if I have respect for you, I look you in the eye. And I talk to you. Okay. And if I can keep eye contact with you, that shows you that I know who you are and I accept who you are. Okay. Really? What a trick. It's not fair. You can, you can fool people by looking them in the eye. No, you need to respect everybody. Being polite and, and following appropriate cultural norms is another way that you show respect for people. As much fun as that is. I'm on the reservation. Thank you. Oh, jeez. It's the real me. Okay. Genuineness. Uh, being sincere and authentic. Being real and allowing your humanness and uniqueness to be seen, uh, being natural, honest, and forthright, admitting mistakes. Uh, it's a little easier for me to, to be genuine because I'm so old that uh, why in the world would I put on airs? Not only that, but I'm going to retire soon. So it doesn't really make any difference. So it's easy for me to be genuine. What you see is what you get because there ain't much else there anyway. So. You know, it's really hard for me to, to, uh, to create uh, illusions because I'm too old to do that. Why would I do that? If I were a young kid, if I were young and I, were, and I was trying to uh, fool everybody, then I would, may not be as genuine as I am. But this is what you got. Sorry. And I do have my flaws. I, Try to talk about them all the time. Okay, I'm sure. Okay, I recognize that. Makes me sad. <clears throat> I try to admit my mistakes. <clears throat> offering advice. Okay, common mistakes that you may you may make. Uh, one of them is offering advice. I try to, never to offer advice to anybody unless they ask me. <clears throat> and then uh, then you have to pull it out of me like you're pulling a, somebody's tooth. It is, it is inappropriate to offer advice until you have fully understood the people involved, uh, their challenges and, and situation, and collaborated with the clients on setting goals. I, I have a former student that wants me to call him because he wants me to give him advice on his romantic life. This is a kid from Bangladesh. I call him a kid. He's 35 years old. And he's got a girlfriend from Canada. Now, what's the probability I can give him good advice? He's in Ohio. He just came back from Bangladesh. He's got a girlfriend from Canada. I haven't seen him in five years. What's the probability I can give him good advice? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, that's, that's impossible. Uh, but he wants me to call him, so I'm going to have to call him one of these days. <laughs> <Wow. years. laughs> But I'm so busy. I've got so many things to grade. I'm putting it on. Okay, I'll call him tonight. You guys talk me into it. Ah, but I'll try not to give him any advice. But he's going to ask me for advice. Uh, he comes from Asia. Asians want you to tell them what to do. It drives you crazy. So if, you, if you're ever counseling somebody from Japan or somebody from China or somebody from Taiwan or somebody from... Iran or Afghanistan or, or Uzbekistan or what, wherever over there, a lot of times they, want, they think you're the expert, so you have to give them advice. Ah, drives you crazy. In the United States, of course, we try not to do this. And I wouldn't have to, because what I'm trying to do is get you to, to uh, come up with your own solution. But over there, they want you to give them advice. Offering advice uh, before you know what the clients have already tried can be experienced 
as not respecting their strengths and their capacities. And of course, a lot of times clients will keep information from you. They won't tell you something. They won't tell you that they've already tried that. They won't tell you that whatever they're, whatever's happening to them. They won't, just won't give you that information. They'll, they'll hand out these, these pieces of information as if they were, as if it were dollar bills that they're handing out. And they'll try to keep as many from you as they possibly can. Drives you nuts. So you have to pull the information out of them slowly. And of course you shouldn't give them, try to give them any advice. Uh, reassuring, uh, this is another common mistake. In an attempt to reduce pain, of course, we, we, we want to make people feel better, right? That's our job, is making people feel better. So how do we do that? Well, a lot of times we, uh, we reassure the, the client. Everything's going to be okay. How the hell can I possibly say that? I've talked to you for 15 minutes, and you've told me what your problem is, and I'm going to tell you everything's going to be okay. Well, it should be more of a question. Everything's going to be okay? Uh, no, no, I'm trying to reassure them, so I tell them everything's going to be okay. Uh, the pain clients feel about their problem can motivate them to solve their own problems, and so the pain is good. The pain has forced them to come in. The pain has forced them to start dealing with their problems. So the pain is good. This is like if you uh, break your arm, and if it doesn't hurt, you keep doing whatever the hell you're doing. But if it hurts, you're going to stop moving it, and now that's good. The pain has told you that, that uh, you, we need to do something about your arm. It's the same way with psychic pain. If you're having a problem, if you're depressed, or if you're <clears throat> anxious, it's because you're, and, and you're in pain, and that pain tells you, I need to fix this, and there's nothing I can do. I'm going to try to, I'm going to, try to drink my problem away, or smoke my, poke my problem away, Smoke marijuana, <laughs> or I'm going to try. I'm going to try to do something to take care of the to alleviate all this pain that I'm in. But a lot of times that doesn't take the the problem away. So it's the pain that makes them come in, and it's the pain that tells them that they need to do something. So the pain is good. If you try to reassure them, then potentially that will help them rationalize their own pain. And now, of course, they're not going to do as much as they would do before. Pain is good. Pain tells you when there's a problem. And, of course, this is what's forcing them to come in and, and seek help. Negating the importance of the client's pain can lead them uh, to feel that they are not fully understood or respected. And, of course, that's a part of the problem as well. They're not going to give you the entire story. They're not going to tell you something that it will embarrass them. But that's part of the story, and that may be the major part of the story. So this may be the, like the tip of the iceberg. They're just giving you all the general uh, ideas of what's going on. But 90% of it is, you know, I messed up. I messed up, and, and I, I did this, and I did that. But I'm not going to tell you that because it hurts too much for me to say that. So you have to get to the point where they will give you that information. For example, telling someone it will all work out in the end, of course, don't do it. Uh, don't worry about it indicates the capacity to stop worrying on command. Uh, what my friend wants me to do is he wants me to make a decision for him so that if it's the wrong decision, he can blame me. That's what he wants me to do, my student. Damn it. <laughs> I've got to call him on the phone. And this is what will happen. So for the first five minutes, he tells me what his problem is. And so then he stops. He won't say anything more. So, so I tell him, well, maybe you can do this. And then he will tell me how wrong that is. Okay, that's what's going to happen. And then, then he's going to give me another little piece of information. And then he's going to stop. And he won't say anything more. And then I will say, well, maybe you can do this. And then he'll tell me why that is so wrong. And we'll do this for like two hours. It is horrible. <laughs> It's really not very much fun. It takes two hours to get him off the phone. <sighs> That's when you need to get a piece of paper. You crumble it up right by the phone. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to remember that. 
Other common mistakes, offering excuses. Uh, if, you, if you allow your, your uh, client to make excuses, um, it, will, uh, it will keep them from setting goals. And what they need to do is set goals. Uh, asking leading questions. Um, the reason that you're asking questions is they're trying to get advice from you. And of course, that's what my, my uh, friend from Bangladesh will, will say. It's going to take me 15 minutes to readjust my brain to understand what he's saying. He's got such a strong accent. But after about 15 minutes, you know, you shift gears in your brain, and all of a sudden, what he says makes sense. He speaks with an Indian accent, Asian Indian, okay. Which, it takes time to figure out what the hell he said. Okay, anyway. He's a, he's a nice kid. I mean, kid. See, I called him a kid again. He's 35 years old. Dominating uh, through teaching. Uh, teaching is dominating or pushy. Uh, it can suggest one right way, and the, the reality is there's a lot of ways to look at things, okay? There's not just one right way. I, I have all the answers, and there's whatever I say is the right way. Okay, that's not correct. Communicating in a dominant way uh, tends to invite people to feel shame or rebellious and to withdraw or become defensive and argue. It implies that there's only one way to resolve an issue, of course, and there's lots and lots of different ways to resolve issues. Um, there is, there's lots of different answers. Uh, what works for one guy may not work for somebody else. Uh, so we, we need to come up with the right answer for you, not for everybody. There is no one right answer. Wouldn't that be great? Uh, yeah, that'd be, that'd be nice if there were only one right answer. Uh, labeling, a uh, sophisticated way of judge, uh, to judge, criticize, or blame another person is, uh, is not going to help. If you call them stupid, you call them an idiot, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. Don't do it. Don't label them. This is a problem that I have. I label things. Well, that was dumb. Wait a minute. Somebody called Trump an idiot the other day. Well, it had to do with the Taliban, inviting the Taliban. They said that was, that was dumb. Uh, he must be an idiot. It was one. <laughs> no. Well, let's not call the president an idiot. That, that doesn't help. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what. Uh, interrogating uh, why questions are particular, particularly problematic because they sometimes imply judgment and also invite defensiveness. And of course, that's what's going to happen with my friend, with my, with my former student. Uh, I'm going to have to, he's going to, he wants me to pull the information out of it. So I'm going to have to start asking why questions. Well, why in the world did you do that? You know, that kind of thing. All right, I'll try not to call him stupid. I promise. He, he's quite bright, actually. He's very, very intelligent. Just can't handle things like other people can. Developing your ability to be empathic. Uh, reading novels and professional literature about people from different backgrounds. Uh, I brag about reading, having read all of Tony Hellerman uh, before I came here. I wasn't really trying to figure out who you guys were. I was just trying to get an idea. It was just giving me an idea. You may hate Hillerman, you may think that he's really off base, uh, that uh, he only talks about people from uh, the Eastern Reservation, but that's where he's from. He's from the East. He actually grew up in uh, Oklahoma, in Shawnee, Oklahoma, with the uh, Shawnee, as weird as that may seem, and the Potawatomi. That doesn't mean anything to any of you guys, but <laughs> those are both tribes that were in my area of Indiana. Okay, not important. Uh, but he uh, grew up with, with natives, so he uh, learned to respect natives by, because all of his friends were native, and, and of course they were different, a different uh, tribal structure, but uh, they were matrilin uh, matrilineal. You guys are matrilineal. So when he came here, he was... Uh, he had primed himself uh, to understand people, to understand uh, individuals. Uh, so if you live in Albuquerque, which is one of the places where he was a, a, a reporter, um, there are individuals that just automatically reject everybody. They, they reject all natives. They're all, you know, drunks and bums and stuff like that. But he was primed to look at people from, from a different perspective. And so that's Tony Hillerman, and that's one of the reasons why his, 
his novels are as good as they are and as accurate as they are. Um, if we had somebody from New York City that came out here and tried to write a novel about about the reservation, it would wouldn't be anywhere close to what Hillerman's was. Uh, so one of the things you can do is read novels. This is what I'm going to have my 350 class do: is read a novel, read something. Mm -hmm. uh, to learn about another culture. I think the best way for you to understand your culture is to compare it with an alien culture, with, with a culture that's not the same. Mm -hmm. uh, so while I am trying to get you to think about another culture, I'm also trying to get you to understand your own culture. It's a trick. It's all a big trick. Okay. Uh, so you need to read literature uh, dealing with uh, people from different backgrounds. Join uh, in activities, uh, talk to and get to uh, know others uh, who have different experiences. Everybody has different experiences. Uh, if, you know, Emory and I talk all the time, me and Moe's talk all the time, but I'm not going to assume that they are the two, those two are the quintessential Navajos on the reservation. You know, I'm just going to assume. <laughs> oh, I, I could do that, though. I mean, I could assume that those two guys are the, are the, uh, the epitome of being Navajo, but uh, that would probably be inaccurate, I'm guessing. And from what I've talked about to, to the two of them, I know that that's not anywhere <laughs> close to being true. Uh, attending classes or workshops focused on specific groups of, of people. Uh, the reality is that when you read something that somebody says, this is how people are, a lot of times they're seeing it from their own point of view. And you need to recognize that. So if it's some jerk from New York City that comes out to the reservation and writes a uh, treatise on Navajos, uh, read it and recognize the fact that this guy probably, that's, that's one perspective. That's just one perspective. I had a friend uh, who's a sociologist. Who wanted to know about socio sociologists? He was a sociologist, and he would go out to the uh, tribal lands of the Fox, the Meskwaki, in Iowa, and he would go there every summer and he would stay there for two weeks. And then he would come back and he would write a book about the Meskwaki. Now, how much can you learn in, I know. How much can you learn in two weeks? He's from California. No offense, uh, people from California. But he was from California and went to Berkeley. And he th thought that he knew everything because, you know, he went to Berkeley. He got his bachelor's degree there. He got his master's degree there. He got his PhD at Berkeley. He'd been two places in his life. He'd been in his hometown and he'd been at Berkeley. That's, that's it. I mean, and then he moved to Iowa. So now he was going to do socio sociological research on the Meskwaki because he'd been around, well, that many natives in his <clears throat> entire life. But he thought he'd do that. Right now, what a goofball. Traveling to different countries and spending time with local residents. Uh, traveling to countries does not tell you what that culture is about. You got to live there or shoot it at them. Then maybe you'll figure out what, what, the, what their culture is about. Uh, but if you don't live there for a select amount of time, then you don't really get in, uh, involved. It's, it's, like, it's like being a tourist. If you just visit France, and you've only been there for uh, two weeks. Do you really understand France? No. You have a, an inkling of what it's like. You have to live in France to understand the French. You have to live in Germany to understand the Germans. You have to live in Korea to understand the Koreans. You have to live in Japan to understand the Japanese. Traveling there doesn't do you any good. <clears throat> I, had a, I was working for a doctor, and he kept traveling all over the world and telling me about all these people. And I was thinking, you know, I've been to Germany. You visited there for two weeks. I lived there for three years. And you're telling me about Germany? Everything you're telling me is everything you saw that they wanted you to see, not what, you know. You, hmm. you never see the warts unless you live there for an extended length of time. Uh, doing volunteer work <clears throat> in communities and neighborhoods very different from your own. Watching pe popular movies about people who are different from you. This is not a bad way to get at least an idea. It's like reading Hillerman. It gives you an idea of what people are like. You can watch a movie. It gives you an idea about what people are like. It tells you that people are different. We want everybody to be the same, right? 
but that's not the way it works, and it's time to stop. So next time I'll show you a bunch of movies that you can watch about different groups of people. And what that mean? What that mean? <laughs> He's such a good soldier. What did you got? Are those the books that I have? Oh, those are mine. Okay. Yeah, here. Make it as small as you possibly can, okay? Can you make it smaller? Oh, <laughs> 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 do you know what you want?